talking about her four kids. Overproduction. That's the cause of all the trouble. Ever since Harvey became a vice president. Vice president? Harvey? He can't even spell the word. That's why they're keeping the boy down in grade two. You mean he hasn't been promoted? Well, promotion-wise, it's a highly competitive market. I mean, you just can't take anything for granted. And one lump or two. Just one moment, sir. Huh? Don't we take most things for granted? Oh, this is some kind of a gag. Those little cubes of sugar, for instance. Where do they come from? Where do sugar cubes come from? Are you kidding? Are they, uh, uh, sort of, uh, well, it's like, uh, yeah. any stupid idiot knows that. Ethel? Uh, yes, sir? You know where sugar cubes come from. Well, of course, George. They come from the grocery store. He means where do they come from in the first place? That's right. Are they animals, vegetables, or minerals? Well, minerals. Don't they cut them up out of big blocks? Of course. That's exactly what I was going to say. They cut them up out of big blocks. Which they dig out of the ground in Siberia. Which they dig out of the... Oh, that's salt. Oh, oh yeah. Well, Betty, you did a course in home economics. How do they make sugar? Well, don't they kind of grow it? That's right. They grow them on sugar bushes. I thought it had something to do with beetroot. Beetroot? Wouldn't they be red? Red, of course. That's it. Sugar cubes come from Cuba. Well, some do, but not these. All right, I'll buy it. Where do they come from? Well, suppose we take a look at that glass of water. Sugar is made from water and air. We can't do it ourselves. The trick of making sugar is a special talent of the vegetable world. And no plant does it more efficiently than the sugar cane. Day by day, the cane takes the water from the soil and the carbon dioxide from the air and stores them in a unique combination that we call sugar. This is Fiji in the South Pacific, where most of the sugar we use in British Columbia is first created. Sugar cane is not grown from seed, but from cutting. Long stalks of a mature cane are fed into a special plow, which cuts them into short pieces. And these are planted horizontally in the soil. Every cutting has three or four buds. Now, soon after planting, the buds sprout, put down roots, and grow into new plants. But the sugar cane is really a kind of grass, a giant perennial grass which may grow 20 feet tall, with stalks as thick as a man's wrist. Sugar cane needs tropical sunshine and plenty of water, as much as 100 inches per acre. But where conditions are right, it grows fast and high, and in a year or so, the crop is ready for harvesting. Slice through a stalk, you'll find it's ripe, crisp, and juicy, sweet as, well, sweet 
his sugar cane. In Fiji, they cut it down by hand. The stalks are trimmed of leaves and loaded onto wagons. The sheer weight of the crop is surprising. One acre may produce 60 or 70 tons of cane stalks, and the harvesting makes hot and thirsty work, even for a man on the wagon. Giant scoops 
pluck the raw sugar from the hose and release it into hoppers which feed onto a moving belt. load is sampled and accurately weighed. Another belt then transports the sugar to a huge warehouse more than 60 feet high and as long as a city block. Inside, the sugar is stored in towering mounds, thousands of tons at a time, a gigantic reservoir of raw sugar to keep the refinery in constant production until the next boat arrives. end loader casually scoops up a ton or so of sugar and delicately dumps it into a conveyor system which leads to the first refining process. Raw sugar is mingled with a hot syrup to form a thick semi-fluid material called magma. This is scrolled to a trough where revolving blades thoroughly blend the mixture. The magma is then fed into a bank of centrifugal machines. In some ways, these are rather like a modern automatic hose washer when it goes into the spin cycle. They have an inner metal basket which revolves at high speed and is perforated with tiny holes or slots. A charge of magma is piped in, the basket spins, and the syrup is spun off. Jets of hot water spray onto the spinning sugar and wash away the dirt and molasses. The machine stops, the washed raw sugar drops out into a trough below. Here it's mixed with hot sweet water and scrolled to the melting tank where revolving paddles stir it until the sugar dissolves. This solution is called washed raw liquor. The sweet water used in the melting is a dilute sugar solution of high purity which is a byproduct of later processes in the refinery. These liquors of different degrees of purity and density are stored in tanks and tallied on an indicator board. After the melting is complete, the washed raw liquor is pumped to the filter house, where diatomaceous earth is added to assist the filtration. The mixture is forced into a filter press, where all the suspended impurities are removed, and a clear, bright, golden solution trickles out of a row of tubes along the drum. of the diatomaceous earth remain behind in the filter and this is opened after every cycle of operation to remove the sludge and wash down the filter leaves. To decolorize the filtered liquor, it is piped into char filters where it trickles slowly through long columns of bone charcoal. Industrially, this process takes place in closed cast iron cylinders 
but it can be watched on a laboratory scale in transparent vessels. The glass jar contains the colored liquor from the filter presses. It drips slowly through a glass column packed with bone char and comes out the other end sparkling clear and water white. From the char filters, the white liquor flows to the liquor gallery, a kind of railroad junction for sugar solutions. Here, the various liquors are inspected, checked, and routed to other points in the refinery. white liquor will be flowing through one channel, while another is bringing the liquor from the tail end of a char filter run. After a certain time, the decolorizing power of the char falls off, and the filtrate becomes golden yellow. The various liquors are stored in large tanks until needed, and samples are constantly analyzed by chemists to see that quality, density, and purity are kept within strict limits. The white liquor at this stage contains about 60% sugar, and it then goes to the pan room to be boiled in evaporators and concentrated. The huge gleaming pans are heated by steam coils and a high vacuum is maintained by condensers and pumps. Gradually, the solution becomes supersaturated and is shocked into crystallization with a small charge of solid sugar. The crystallization proceeds rapidly while a technician watches through an inspection port. Inside the vacuum pan, the liquor boils furiously. When the process is nearly complete, the pan is sampled and the sample inspected. When the crystal size is right, the contents of the pan are discharged into another bank of centrifugal machines where the mother liquor is spun off. As before, the sugar is sprayed with pure water, this time to remove all traces of syrup from the surface of the crystals. Indicator dials record the cycling of the purging process while the sugar crystals, almost 100% pure sucrose, spin in the basket. At this stage, the centrifugals are completely automatic, their operations regulated by electric relays and preset time controls. The moist sugar crystals discharged from the centrifugals are conveyed to the granulators, king-sized tumbler dryers. Inside, they are fitted with a series of shallow shells which ultimately lift the sugar and shower it through a current of hot air while the drum revolves. And this is where the final product emerges. Pure white granulated cane sugar, for sifting on strawberries, for baking a cake, or ready for packing in those familiar five-pound bags.
pounds of sugar, 80 ounces of tropical sunshine, coming your way. Well, that's fine, but uh, how about the cubes? Yeah, yeah, the big blocks, where do they cut them up? Don't they freeze them like uh, ice cubes? No, that the icing sugar. Well, that's something else again. Icing sugar is made by taking regular granulated sugar and grinding it to a fine powder. It's used to make confectioner's icing. But we do use sugar in many different forms. The golden yellow filtrate we saw flowing into the liquor gallery is boiled to make golden yellow sugar. The yellow and brown sugars we use on our porridge and in cooking are basically the same pure sucrose as the granulated white. The color and flavor come from the natural juices of the sugar cane. And golden sugar leads to golden syrup. This favorite dessert topping is really a highly concentrated solution of invert sugar. The sucrose has been converted into a mixture of two other natural sugars, glucose and fructose. The presence of each one prevents the crystallization of the other, and so the mixture remains permanently liquid. A golden stream of pure, sweet flavor. And purity is paramount. In the laboratories, a constant watch is kept to maintain the highest quality. Samples are checked and double-checked. Everything from the raw sugar to the finished product is carefully analyzed and examined for purity, food value, and appearance. Throughout the world, scientists in the sugar industry are working on methods of improving the yields from natural sources, testing new refining techniques, and finding ways to meet the ever-increasing demand. For sugar, is one of our major food sources. In North America, the average man or woman consumes nearly 100 pounds of sugar every year, enough to fill this giant bag on its way maybe to a bakery or a manufacturer of jams and jellies. Sugar in large bags or in small ones, like these tiny packets made for airlines and restaurants. Large bags, square packets, square boxes, square cubes. Where do they come from? Well, it starts with a controlled boiling in the pan room. The sugar is spun in the centrifugals, and the moist crystals are fed into a special tube press. Yes, each cube is individually molded in a rotary press. The cubes drop out onto trays, and the trays are passed on a conveyor into drying ovens. machinery packs the dried cubes into boxes, while another machine takes hopper loads of cubes, assembles them into a moving straight line, and passes them to an ingenious wrapping device. This mechanical marvel wraps and seals the little twin cubes that you find in hotels and cafes. Two lumps, untouched by human hands, until now. You know, they are rather cute. How about you, Betty? One or two? Oh, no, not for me. I have to count my calories. Well, let's count them right. In two cubes of sugar, you get 30 calories. That's less than one strip of bacon. Half a sausage, one pat of butter, 
or even a small corner of that steak you just put away. Sure makes you think. Yes, it's food for thought, and food for energy, too. One of nature's richest gifts to feed mankind. Sugar, sweet sugar, bringing a touch of sunshine into our daily lives and our daily coffee, whether you take one lump or two.